Um, but the, our, his master's committee is here and we're, we can um, ask him questions after the, this public presentation. Um, and so to introduce Devin, so Devin um, has an interesting background. He started off um, doing, uh, what, what do you call it, like health healthcare marketing? Is that kind of? That's right, marketing in the healthcare. Yeah. So the way I understand it, correct me if I'm wrong, is that he was doing a lot of this work and, you know, doing health marketing kind of work um, and got intrigued by a lot of the um, patients he was, he was meeting um, during some breast cancer uh, videos. Is that correct? So, That's right. For the Coleman Foundation. Yeah, for Susan Coleman Foundation. Anyway, so he was, um, and I think he already he had interest in biology, I think, you know, before that. And so he, he converged those together and uh, came back to Clemson or... You're, I don't. I don't he, he'll have to fill on the details. But he started. He, he was an undergrad at Clemson, right. and he's he um didn't get a bachelor's degree because you went you went straight into the master's program, correct? Uh, that's okay. right. Yeah, I had a bachelor's degree before that, and I almost finished a bachelor's degree. <laughs> yeah, I know. This, <laughs> you're, it's all it's all finishing up. Ninety nine percent. Expert there you go. <laughs> anyway, I say that not to this. Is where like he's just he's had an interesting, but kind of a little interesting uh, path. Um, but he is part of this ma bachelor's and master's program that we're doing in the department. So it's kind of an accelerated way to get a master's degree. Um, and he's um, uh, done some work. He's done, he's done work in, in, in my lab. He's going to present today on some computational biology work he's done. But he's also done a lot of wet bench work and some other bioinformatics work before he, at Clemson before he came in my lab. Um, so he's got, a, he's got a, a lot of experience doing um, wet bench work, like actually pipetting at the bench and doing computational stuff. And just my, my plug, they're both ways to do experimental science. Just say it. Um, anyway, uh, so uh, that's like just a, in a, a quick nutshell about, about Devin. And he's going to give his uh, thesis defense today on integrating OMIM and intact data for the analysis of gene phenotype interactions in complex diseases, a Linux-based computational tool for network analysis. So one of the lo longer titles I've seen. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but very descriptive, which is much better than short. So anyway, I'm going to pass it on to you, Dan. Okay, I've unmuted. Uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for coming. I uh, just want to say thank you again for all of your help and mentorship, your great classes, your mentorship, Dr. Feltis, and all of your help in putting together this workflow. Uh, and I'm going to try to start pretty broadly with you as to why I developed this program and then work my way into the specifics, uh, starting with just how complicated biology is in general. <laughs> so uh, I think we all know that, it, I mean, you know, it would be very convenient for us uh, as researchers if biology turned out to be rather simple, or even if it was as simple as RNA polymerase too, binding to a bunch of transcription factors and to a promoter and transcribing a gene, but there's so much else involved, uh, chromatin modifications, proteins involved in that, uh, methyl or acetyl groups being added to histones and so on and so forth. And it's only natural uh, as researchers and within our limitations as humans to tease apart and, and break down each and every process in a linear sort of fashion in this cause and effect kind of manner uh, to describe each and every process when we know that in reality, nature sort of thinks in these networks of all these processes, which are tied together in a completely convoluted manner that would appear uh, to be like chaos, to the human eye, but we know there's all this higher level of organization involved here. So that's in a nutshell uh, what moved me, I don't want to say completely out of the wet lab, but more and more toward uh, computational biology or being very inspired about the future of taking high performance computational approaches uh, to analyzing complex sets of biomolecules such as genes, proteins, uh, or RNAs. And so my program that I've developed for my thesis is my first attempt at taking what we tend to call a systems approach to biology or a systems uh, approach to genetics in this, in this context where we want to model some system of communication between biomolecules and maybe model a network of communication between another group of biomolecules 
map those together and represent them using two very simple fundamental particles. Uh, nodes, which represent each feature that we're analyzing, and edges, which represent relationships between those features. So the features might be proteins. We might be building a protein, a network that models protein overlap between diseases. Um, and nodes will, would represent proteins and edges or lines connecting these dots would represent uh, relationships between those. Uh, and then I'm gonna finish up my talk with, uh, hopefully I can convince you why I think that what I could get done in my master's thesis, uh, what this program does in its current version is allows for the construction of gene networks using a couple of databases I'm gonna tell you about that I think serve as a strong foundation for building much more complex models of uh, biological communication. And I'm also gonna walk you through uh, the measurements that my program takes. So by looking at how many nodes, each and every node is connected to in the network, by looking at the overall shape of the network and by clustering nodes based off of what we call centrality, which I'll tell you about in a minute, uh, we can get an idea of the importance of certain nodes in a network, or in other words, in our, in our context, certain biological molecules of importance to, a, to processes in a network. But we can also just get an idea of their importance to communication flow uh, in a network. But before I really get into the details, I just want to quickly define what an API is, because I'm going to use this term throughout the talk. It stands for application programmatic interfaces, which, although it sounds like a mouthful, uh, it's pretty straightforward. And if you think about it, the name very clearly describes exactly what it is. It's just an interface that allows code to be written into a program that can access a remote database from somewhere and get lots of data or even complex or have access to complex software or algorithms from somewhere else. And I don't know if you've heard the term APIs. It's one of those terms I take for granted now, but if you've heard it thrown around, if you have any friends that work in programming and they talk enthusiastically about APIs, it's kind of because in modern web-based apt computing, APIs have really become uh, what makes the world go round. Whereas like, uh, <laughs> Programs in the 1980s and 1970s uh, and much of the 1990s and perhaps even 2000s had to be bought at a store, uh, installed into your computer, and then to do really impressive stuff had to take up a whole lot of space uh, and a whole lot of and use a whole lot of memory. Uh, what makes your smartphone so powerful is that it uses APIs everywhere. So if you have like an app that checks that you want to check the weather on, I'm sure you do quite frequently, use an API every time you're doing that. The weather app uses this interface in order to communicate with uh, a, a weather database, which other programs might be retrieving data from. And then the weather app just sort of takes the credit for that, <laughs> gives you the weather. So uh, I've used APIs to communicate with two databases that uh, my program really revolves around. A couple of my favorite databases uh, the, the program uses a couple more, but it, I'm in the thesis, I really just focus on these. Uh, the OMIM database and INTACT database. So let me just quickly introduce you to what those are. The OMIM database, I think, is best illustrated by this graphic that I got uh, on, the, on the bottom right. So this it, it centers around two types of entries. OMIM is a website that you go and you can visit each of these entries as web pages. So you could think of OMIM as being built of two different types of web pages, phenotype entry web pages and gene entry web pages. My, the input for my program is a list of phenotype entries. So what is that? So what OMIM does is it attempts to take diseases that perhaps for many decades we kind of thought of as one disease, and it tries to recategorize those diseases as families, which they call which they call a phenotypic series. And a phenotypic series is just a, le a, a list of phenotype entries. 
So what a phenotype entry is, is it's just a listing on the OMOM database that corresponds to a disease subtype. So one of many diseases in a family of diseases for breast cancer, for instance. Uh, if you go to the webpage, you'll see for the phenotype entry, you'll see a list of text descriptions of phenotypic outcomes, uh, symptoms that were recorded in patients with this disease subtype. At the top, you'll also see a list of gene entry links. And if you click on one of those gene entry links, it'll take you to a gene entry webpage. And then on that page, you'll have a link of phenotype entries that that gene is, is mapped to. So that's what OMUM is really just trying to do is it, it, it's an attempt. It, it's been around since the 1960s, but made its way to the World Wide Web in 2010. And it's an attempt to take diseases and to better categorize them, to subdivide them into subtypes that can be described a little bit more uh, explicitly by their uh, phenotypic outcomes and genetic relationships. Uh, and a phenotypic MIM number might look something like this. Uh, it's always preceded by a hash symbol. It's a six-digit number, and it corresponds to some disease subtype like this, hypophos uh, adult hypophosphatasia, which itself is part of a, a greater phenotypic series of, of, of uh, two other types of hypophosphatasia. And a gene uh, entry is similar. It's another six-digit number, but it's uh, instead pre preceded by an asterisk. So if you if you uh, search for this number on the OMUM database, you'll you'll be brought to the colon A1 webpage on OMUM for that. And and then just briefly, I just wanted to say how, how does OMUM decide what genes should be mapped to disease subtypes? Well, these are the criteria that are listed on their FAQ on their website, but it's also taken uh, from their original paper, uh, which you can visit, which is from 2005. Uh, and so they take all of these things, they have their own way of measuring uh, these parameters in order to decide if genes should be included in any given list. Uh, but most of it centers around uh, allelic variants, which you see here in the bottom right. Intact is a very different kind of setup from OMUM, but rather straightforward to describe. Um, this is a screenshot from the Intact website, and I have searched the gene ALPL, and what you get back is a bunch of usually gene names. There's some uh, inconsistency at the intact database, and this is natural in bioinformatics, but for the most part, intact prefers to use HGNC approved gene symbols. I think this is because uh, they tend to be uh, present in a lot of databases, and it's tough to find an identifier that is super universal. Uh, and then you'll also notice the uh, the protein representations are colored in different colors. Uh, the dark blue is for Homo sapiens, and my program will actually filter out uh, proteins for Homo sapiens. So if I wasn't clear, what Intact does is you give it a gene, and what Intact gives you back is something that looks like this, but underneath it, you can't see it, but there's also, you can download a whole table of these. And now you have a list of genes whose products are known to interact with either the ALPL gene itself to either bind to that gene or to interact with one of its protein products. So here's how it works. Um, the, the real star of the show is this genophenoSH. It sort of started as a tentative name and stuck. <laughs> But uh, .sh is, uh, in programming or in, in the computer world, that's what we call a shell script. And .py stands for Python script. Script is, for all intents and purposes, kind of a, a word that's interchangeable with program, uh, at least for the purposes of this talk. And you could think of genophenoSh as really just a list of commands that I've put together that allow for these three Python scripts to be executed in this order after taking your input uh, or specific to your input, and then uh, you'll get final output from each of these uh, Python scripts, particularly from the last one you see graph.py. So there's just these three Python programs, and I'm just gonna walk you through them uh, right now. So your input is a list of disease subtypes. 
So what you do is you take, you, you might go to the OMM database and you might look up the phenotypic series for say, uh, as I have osteogenesis imperfecta. Uh, and you have a whole bunch of uh, disease subtypes in that phenotypic series. And you might go to the website and collect all of the numbers that correspond to each of these disease subtypes and put them in a little text file. Uh, you then can just simply run that text file with genophenot.sh and it'll take care of all of, uh, it'll run these programs for you. And let me explain exactly what it does. For each input number, which corresponds to disease subtype on OMUM in your input list, the program first contacts OMUM using the API and, uh, and asks OMUM, okay, can you give me Give me back all of the clinical data, the clinical features, like I described earlier, text descriptions of patient outcomes in this disease, and also give me that uh, gene list, the list of associated genes that meet OMUM's criteria to be associated with this disease subtype. So if you have a list of, uh, you know, a bunch of disease subtypes, but you kind of want to treat it as one list, as one phenotypic series, like a disease family, and analyze that or build a network model of that, uh, that's what my program is really trying to do. The OMUM data that comes back is then formatted into a special type of table that we call an edge list. So it's just a table, but it's a table in, in such a form that it's useful for creating these network visualizations. You can use it as input in this software suite that I developed, but you can also use it in more popular programs uh, available on the internet. So you have two edge lists, which are going to eventually be built into graphs or visualizations, and measurements are going to be taken of those. Uh, but in the meantime, this uh, second script, so what I just told you is created by table.py. Next, this program interactors.py will take all of the genes that we retrieve from OMM, and for each and every gene ID, we'll ask intact, what are all of the known protein interactors and homo sapiens for, for that gene input. And then, yeah, as I, I guess I already just mentioned, after that, the program will go ahead and, and calculate summary statistics. So this is from the paper that I submitted for the thesis, but, and I'm not gonna, I'm just gonna be as brief as I can, but I just wanted to emphasize, you start with a list of disease subtype inputs. So I'd, I'd like, I'd like to make this a little more user friendly in the in the future. Maybe you can type the disease subtype, but this is really the best, most straightforward. This is very common in bioinformatics where you might go retrieve a list of numbers and then you just run it through this program. Uh, three tables are created. One that shows shared proteins or protein relationships between uh, genes that were implicated in the disease. Uh, a list of or, or, or shared genes in the disease, probably should have said that first, <laughs> and shared clinical features between uh, the subtypes in your input list. So I'll just walk you briefly through each script, starting with table.py. So what table.py, the first script in this, in these, in this little trio of Python scripts, uh, what it does is basically automates going to this web page. <laughs> this is the a phenotypic entry for Ehlers-Danlos syndrome type two. In the top left, you can see one of those uh, phenotypic MIM numbers, as Omen calls it, a reference IDs for a disease subtype. At the very bottom right, it's not highlighted, but you can see gene locus MIM number. Those are the gene IDs I'm talking about. So if you click on that number, it'll take you to the page for COL5A2, and that page itself will show you uh, what other uh, disease subtypes, coal, uh, CoL5A2 is actually linked to. So table.py will, will get all of the clinical data for every number. It'll get all of the, uh, the gene sets associated with each number. And it creates a, a table that looks like this. This is an edge list. Uh, and at the bottom is what it will look like after graph.py visualizes that or grabs it. So if you can see in the very right, you have all of your phenotype MIM numbers. Uh, they're repeating because it's iterating and going through the same MIM number and getting all of these features as, as the table is built. Uh, you can see that these are the features themselves, which are symptoms recorded in patients. And then on the very left, what you have is uh, abbreviations 
for the disease subtype. So osteogenesis imperfecta type two. Uh, and those correspond, they're, they're really the same thing as the phenotype MIM number. Uh, the phenotype MIM number is unique to, to these abbreviations, just to be clear. Oh, uh, and yeah, in the example, you can see uh, just one feature, blue sclerae, which is on the table as well. Uh, and then we can see in this little uh, blown up depiction, the red box of the, of the greater network, you, you can see blue sclerae is shared between at least these uh, three subtypes. It, it's also shared be between four others that aren't shown in the picture. And so if you kept scrolling down on this table, what you'd eventually see is you'd see blue sclery come up several more times. And on the left, you'd see it correspond to OI10 and OI18, et cetera. So I, 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 don't, I hope it's clear. And if you have any questions about that, feel free to ask. Um, now we're at the end of the talk. <clears throat> the second edge list, the table.py, uh, constructs is uh, one that depicts the gene sets associated with each subtype. And the graph that comes out of graph.py might look something like this. You might notice that there are only a few genes and subtypes in this graph. It's not very big, and yet we have all these genes in the edge list on the left. And so just to be clear, uh, what my program's doing is it's dropping any genes that aren't that aren't shared between disease subtypes, there's dropping the subtypes uh, that don't share any genes. So you can see after you uh, graph this whole edge list with so many genes in it, uh, it just turns out the COL1A1 and COL1A2 are the only shared genes, and they're shared between four subtypes of osteogenesis imperfecta, uh, and sort of asymmetrically. Okay, the final, that third edge list that I mentioned is create is actually created by the second script. The other two were actually created by table.py, but this one's created by a program I called interactors.py. Uh, and the reason is because uh, the edge list in the previous program, I'd, I, I had designed all the code to, uh, to make those edge lists. But when we call the intact API, it actually just gives us an edge list in, in the proper format uh, from the get-go. And this, and this is what it looks like. It looks a lot different. Uh, if you think it looks confusing, well, this is actually just a few of 99 columns that are <laughs> in the original edge list that you get back. So just to be clear and remind you, at this point, interactors.py takes as input the output from the previous script, or one of the outputs, which is the gene edge list that I just showed you over here. So it's taking the, it's taking the gene edge list uh, over here, and for each and every gene ID, it's querying intact and, re and retrieving zero to many inter uh, protein interactors, and it's listing them in this way. As I mentioned, uh, intact prefers to use HGNC gene symbols, and those are on the very right of this uh, of this edge list example that I'm showing you. So you can see Col1A1 or Col1A2 in there uh, in that screenshot, but then in the bottom. Uh, it, it's a little difficult to read, but you can, those genes in the center are COL1A1 and COL1A2. Uh, it's a little hard to read, but at the top right, uh, there is a gene that is not in the original gene set. That was a gene found by the intact database. So I think that uh, beyond making pretty pictures of networks, I think what I'm most excited about is actually getting into the topological features of these networks. Real uh, graph theory, as we call it, or network science, where we model these things as nodes and edges, and then we try to take several measurements, which you can think of these measurements as pretty much the exact same thing that you do in the wet lab, or not maybe not exact, but uh, but very similar in the sense that Measurements are a thing that each have their own limited scope. And so we have to take all kinds of different measurements to get a lot of little different scopes and we put them together in order to get a bigger picture. And so I'm gonna walk you through these uh, as fast as I can, these seven metrics that I chose uh, to implement into the program, which both describe the network as a whole and attempt to cluster nodes. So the first thing that we do is we just simply look at how many constituents there are in a network. 
Uh, we just look at how many nodes there are and count how many edges there are. And this tells us, uh, roughly speaking, very generally, I caution very generally, uh, something of the complexity of the network in the sense that if we have more and more parts, you have uh, a more uh, complicated system. But it's a little more uh, informative to actually take the number of nodes and take the number of edges and create a ratio out of that. So to do that, we use the next thing we look at is, or we calculate is called average node connectivity or average degree connectivity, where we look at each and every node and we just ask what, in general, how many nodes is every node connected to in this network? Uh, you can imagine if you, uh, if you were to hold the, no the number of nodes constant and you were to keep adding edges, and, I'm, and of course, you know, you have a little formula here, edges being uh, in the numerator, uh, that you must have a more interconnected network. There's nowhere to add those uh, edges except for nodes that already exist. So by looking at this ratio of edges to nodes, we can get an idea of a, a, a general correlation to how uh, interconnected the network is which tells us something a little more of its complexity. Now there's this, uh, this other metric called network diameter of the largest component that it's the next thing that the program measures. Uh, I kind of forgot to explain uh, earlier what a largest component is, but a largest, what I should have been clear about is that on any of these graphs, you may have two components of edges and nodes that are disconnected from one another. Usually we end up with one component. Oftentimes, if you run a lot of these things, as I have, you, you find a lot of your output is one large component and then a, little, a lot of little artifacts of uh, smaller disconnected components to the graph. So uh, it's often useful to take a measurement from the largest component. Uh, such as the network diameter. And the network diameter tells us something of the, the efficiency level uh, of dissemination of information across the network. By taking the two nodes that are the furthest apart and asking what is the shortest path and number of edges that would connect those nodes, we, uh, and, then, and then taking that number as a measure of the network diameter, we can tell a little bit of something about the ratio of the ability to disseminate, disseminate information or travel through fewer edges, even as the network gets larger and larger. Uh, underneath that, I, I just showed that you, we, another way that it's calculated is that you use uh, what we call the weights of edges, where you assign a numeric value to each edge based off of some other data you might be incorporating in the network. But my, my program actually just uses the top method, just calculating network diameter in number of nodes. <clears throat> Next, there's this uh, metric that is called transitivity, which describes just the general tendency of any given three nodes to form a triangle or a transitive triad, as we call it. And it turns out that from studies done on, on social networks in humans, studies done in uh, applying graph theory to biological molecules and building biological network models, that the tendency uh, to form these triads or these triangles tends to be rather correlated with some kind of functional modules, or in our case, in our context, it could be something like a biological pathway. So it, it, it gives us some kind of insight into the level of organization in the network. So last two metrics, uh, they don't really describe the network. They aren't, I don't use them in my program to describe the network at whole or take sort of an average. Uh, I use these metrics to attempt to rank and cluster nodes. And they both center around this notion of centrality. There are two types of, I, I chose two ways to measure centrality beginning with between is centrality, but what centrality is altogether is the general tendency of a node to be important to inter information flow within the network by looking at, you know, if we take into consideration the, on the top right, like this red node, for instance, it doesn't have very many connections. 
yet it's connecting to very densely connected regions of a graph. Without this red node, uh, you, you would have no way for these two regions to communicate, communicate with one another altogether. So between a centrality is a measurement of that. And just under that, I just have another example of that where you can see that you can quantify it and you kind of eyeball and see that the number four has probably got the highest between a centrality and indeed it does. It's, it's value of 15 is more than twice the value of any other nodes. So my program will um, calculate the between a centrality for all nodes and rank the top 20 of those and give you that for output. And that's ranking. I also want to try uh, classification to some extent by creating, and I'll remind you, modularity class is sort of uh, in network science. It's pretty much synonymous with classification or creating uh, groups of nodes. But uh, as I had mentioned, you know, the red node in between in this between a centrality example doesn't isn't connected to many nodes. Now, say you do want to take that into consideration. So in order for something to have a high value, it also needs to be connected to a lot of nodes. Well, eigenvector centrality is a way of measuring the centrality of a node while taking that into consideration, which just gives us another uh, uh, another edge, another uh, a measurement of a little bit different scope when taking into consideration or, or trying to look at how tightly uh, connected subgroups in a network are. So by clustering these nodes together, we can identify uh, tightly clustered nodes, which you might later run uh, gene enrichment analysis on or, or further explore in other ways. So, <laughs> excuse me. <laughs> All right, so uh, I ran, I wanted to, I wanted to examine three phenotypic series for uh, and see how they ran in the program. I wanted to look at the summary output and I wanted to look at the metrics that the summary output gave me. And I wanted to see uh, if the kinds of numbers I got were different from random. So I looked at three diseases, the first being this disease hypophosphatasia, which is rather monogenic. It uh, really just centers around one gene, ALPL, alkaline phosphatase, which is responsible for breaking down pyrophosphate or diphosphate molecules into individual inorganic phosphate molecules in bone forming matrix vesicles. So what happens is without uh, alkaline phosphatase, you get a buildup of pyrophosphate. You don't have any uh, inorganic phosphate, which is necessary for collagen deposition in the bone. And you have osteoclasts come in and eat away at the bone over and over again, expecting osteoblasts to come in and perform their usual functions of bone formation, but that doesn't occur and the bone wastes away. So I thought, why not look at, a, at, a, at another uh, bone wasting disorder, but one with uh, a whole lot of different genes involved? Not to mention more genes involved altogether. And so osteogenesis imperfective is an interesting disease to take a look at and has uh, a great deal of genes in its phenotypic series, two of which are COL1A1 and COL1A2, which I showed you earlier. This disease works a little differently from, I mean, it, it does have to do with issues and uh, problems that occur in collagen deposition, but not because of pyrophosphate, like, like I mentioned in, in uh, hypophosphatasia. And lastly, I want to look at a disease that was pretty different from either of Miller Stanless syndrome, although there, it does have something in common, which I'll mention in a second. Uh, but uh, the phenotypic outcome is rather than brittle bones, uh, super elastic skin or hyper elastic joints. So it's a, it's a connective tissue disorder. So uh, I see it's missing here, but there are, there are three subtypes in hypophosphatasia's phenotypic series. Uh, so it's a rather small phenotypic series, and everything is mapped to the same gene, ALPL. It's kind of unusual in OMIM. So I thought it'd be interesting to see if I happen to get any interesting results anyways by running hypophosphatasia through the program. Uh, osteogenesis imperfecta and ehlers danlos syndrome both roughly have a similar, they have much, a similar amount of subtypes and genes and much more of them. And as it turns out, uh, osteogenesis imperfecta 
90% of all cases worldwide occur because of something to do with COL1A1 or COL1A2, two of the genes out of the 19 genes in the uh, phenotypic series gene set. Uh, even though uh, a great deal of the subtypes listed on OMUM do not have those genes in them, most cases uh, have to do with a, only uh, are, are linked to only a few subtypes on OMUM, which lists one or both of these genes. Uh, Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, as it turns out, also has COL1A1 and COL1A2 in its gene set. Uh, however, it has no other overlap with the gene set of osteogenesis imperfecta. So this is, what I did was with each disease, I, I, I took each disease, I ran it through the program, taking into account how many numbers were in the input MIM list. And I developed a program to, to generate a, a random MIM generator that would generate as many MIMs as I wanted and put them into lists for me that I could run in the program. And so I compared the results that I got from the osteogenesis imperfecta summary statistics to the results of 100 lists of 20 randomly generated MIMS. I did this for each disease, changing the number of MIMS based on how many MIMS was in the disease, uh, the target disease I was looking at. And at first the results weren't so great. Uh, this is, the screenshot here is from uh, what, the, what the program did for the first few months I was developing it. These, uh, off to the side, you see these sort of uh, flower blossom looking things, uh, <laughs> which are not in any of the, the networks that I just showed you because those are features that don't overlap. Those are features that are unique to, to those subtypes. And so uh, the program was designed to sort of push them off to the right so you could focus on the overlap in the center. But I noticed after running a whole lot of these things that there was a whole lot of variation in those, uh, especially when uh, I developed the gene networks. Uh, you might have very few of those, you might have a whole lot of them. And I wondered if that was creating noise. So I wanted to see what would happen is if we ran all the experiments uh, after dropping nodes of degree equals one, as we call it, or, or, or nodes that did, were not linked to any other nodes. So we modified, I modified the program to do that. And then after that, I found a whole lot more significant results, which uh, previously I'd only found a few. And I'm just gonna go over the results of the, uh, of, from after I modified the program pretty briefly. Uh, the clinical features network had a lot of significant results. I forgot to uh, clarify that the right p-value basically shows if we run all these experiments and we take a, and we take a measurement, this measurement every time from these experiments, what proportion of those is the value in my target set less than, and then vice versa for the the left p-value, uh, and then I just for convenience color coded anything that would meet a p-value threshold of less than. 0.01 is blue, and if it met a uh, p-value threshold of alpha equals is less than or equal to 0.05, it's in green. And so uh, we, it looked like when I ran this, unlike the previous attempt, there were a number of nodes, number of edges, and average node connect connectivity seemed to have some pretty significant results with every single set, even with the hypophosphatasia phenotypic series. The best results came from the gene networks. So I'll remind you that these were just constructed uh, based off of genes that were shared between your input uh, phenotype MIMS. And uh, <laughs> this is a great improvement for before. Uh, so I think I, I forgot to mention that, you know, I included transitivity in this table, but transitivity is actually only applicable to the final network statistics I'm going to show you, uh, because you cannot use them, you cannot use transitivity as a measure unless all nodes are the same thing. And as you might recall, the only graph where all nodes are the same thing is, uh, is the protein graph I made where all nodes consist of gene IDs. So not, not to, to get too tangented there, but uh, 
I, I included them in all of the graphs. So that's the reason it's zero. So this was this felt like a, a sort of a home run for that graph. For the protein interactions network that I constructed, uh, I had previously found no significant statistics. So this gave me a little bit more hope. I noticed that there's not really, I couldn't really see a pattern in what, in which statistics were significant, except for trans, in transitivity. In this case, it looks like transitivity was finally the star player where it was uh, an applicable metric. So what is it I'm trying to do here? I just want to stop for a second real quick and clarify that what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to identify which metrics are most appropriate for which types of graphs that I've generated. Which ones, is there a pattern to these uh, statistics being significant, uh, such as number of nodes, number of edges? Do those, do it, if I'm, I'm running my program on a group of diseases, are those going to be significant every time or are different, are different features going to be significant depending on the graph? So that's something I'm interested in, expl in uh, exploring in the future. But what I'm really just trying to do right now is just validate that if you run a phenotypic series through the program, so if you run a group of MIM numbers that, you, that, that we know are related based off of OMIM's criteria, uh, and if we and we know that when we compare our results to random, uh, we very uh, often um, we most often will see uh, a distinguishing figure. Uh, then we can validate that the program works when diseases are related. And later, you could take a group of MIM numbers that you hypothesize would be related to another group of MIM numbers and run that to the program. But the program's not there yet. I think it's just sort of still in this phase of trying to validate that it that it can effectively distinguish. Uh, networks using these metrics, and I'm still trying to figure out which metrics are best to use for which uh, for which graph. So uh, there's one final graph that I didn't mention. I didn't mention it in the figure uh, or anywhere else yet because I want to keep the, those three edge lists. But there's actually one final edge or one final graph that's produced where we take the OMM <clears throat> gene list. Uh, that we originally got back from table.py. We take the protein interactors uh, list that we got back from intact from the intact API, and we try to, to determine which OMM genes are actually on the intact list. So which OMM genes do we know interact with one another through their protein products? And we cre and and so these were the uh, results that I got for that. Which and so it was, it was difficult. I was a little surprised to see that these were some of the least significant results, since this is uh, such a refined and specific thing to do. But uh, but nonetheless, I think that these were sort of promising, and definitely better than the first time uh, when I ran these graphs or when I ran these uh, diseases to the program without eliminating uh, nodes that weren't overlapping. So uh, I developed the program as a tool in beginning to uh, build models of biological communication, starting with genes and proteins. Uh, and I thought it, that the data contained in OMIM and the intact databases should be very useful for this. OMIM, OMIM is a very highly curated database. Uh, and, and as I mentioned, it's been around since the 1960s and intact, has a whole lot of protein interactor information that might lead us to targets that we weren't initially considering based off of genes that were linked to these diseases. Uh, then I conducted several experiments to validate the performance of the program on the three diseases I walked you through. It turned out that excluding nodes that, that were not overlapping nodes, nodes less than or equal to degree of one, helped to result in more uh, sig significantly improved results. And uh, I think it demonstrated the potential of the program in creating networks that could be a good foundation for, for creating more complicated networks. So, uh, and yeah, so now I'll just go through the limitations real fast with you, which is, 
first of all, we only uh, the the significant output that we obtained. Uh, we didn't do the a a super in we we could do a whole lot more statistics. I just want to be clear at this phase that the idea is I'm trying to decide which statistics to even take from the program in the first place, and then identify and then to run phenotypic series through the program until I can get more and more significant results. Uh, and then it's also important to consider that while it was great that I did test uh, three phenotypic series, uh, it would be nice to test a whole lot more. <laughs> so it'd be nice to first rerun the test on the same phenotypic series that I used, but to do it with a thousand random MIMS instead of a hundred or lists of random MIMS, maybe 10,000. Uh, and then furthermore, after that, it'd be great to look at other phenotypic series to make sure that the results that I did get weren't out of weren't completely due to chance or luck. Um, and it's important to consider the limitations or biases that could arise from just OMM's criteria, intax criteria, the criteria on, on one of the first slides that I showed you, which you can review in their paper. Um, and because of this criteria, that, that means that depending on how OMM might choose to categorize these things, some diseases may be more related uh, by their phenotypic outcomes than, than their gene relationships and vice versa. Bioinformatics is an imperfect and ever improving science. And so this is just part of the nature of that. Uh, and then, as I said, you know, I took sort of a preliminary approach before getting into deep statistical analysis uh, to get my figures. Uh, and, Clearly, uh, the performance of the program is going to work better if you have bigger lists, uh, so larger phenotypic series. So I got a few less results for hypophosphatasia in my analysis. Uh, and I think I got a little bit of ahead, a little bit ahead of myself here in the uh, describing the future directions. Uh, further validate the program's capabilities, use larger batches of random controls. Uh, but most importantly, at the bottom, just to emphasize one more time, I want to identify which metrics I want to run many phenotypic series of the program and identify if there's any pattern, if, if any metrics tend to be significant more often on, on different types of networks. So, for instance, the gene networks, it may be the case that number of nodes is, is never significant when you analyze one of these sets, but that uh, the number of edges tends to be significant. I want to find and map which statistics are are significant depending on the graph type and then uh, gear future development of the program around that. Um, <laughs> and so that's pretty much what I just said. <laughs> and uh, and then we're really getting to the end here, but I just uh, wanted to say also be clear that you know the protein network I, I made came from the the OMUM gene list that we got back. Now what I didn't get to do yet that I think would be interesting and I'll just briefly mention is to actually build that network based off of the gene overlap that we got back from OMUM. So I don't think I was clear before, but the the protein interaction network I created, actually uses all of the genes that we retrieved for a moment. It was the first thing I wanted to try and there wasn't time to, to construct protein networks based off of the overlapping networks that we got back from OMIM. So, so the one that shows the interacting OMIM genes, that graph, and the one that shows uh, shared genes between OMIM disease subtypes, I think it would be great to use those as a foundation to create protein networks and see what kind of statistics we get from that. Um, and last but not least, uh, we, when we really validate, when we, when we can be sure that this is a strong foundation, when it's really clear that when you run uh, a phenotypic series versus a group of random M numbers to the program, and most of the time, if not all of the time, you, you, you get the significant metrics that you expect, then I think we have a strong foundation for building much more complex network models things that could actually model uh, other biomolecules 
other networks that we could build that we could map to it and then we could really uh, we could build and we could use various other APIs and take further steps to build gene co-expression networks and eventually uh, the ultimate prize of building sort of a comprehensive model of a gene regulatory network. So I just mean by identifying transcription factors using something like the Enricher API, uh, by adding more data to our protein interaction networks, such as the direction of the interaction uh, or binding affinity or things like that. We use the string API. That's something I've looked into. Uh, we can use all these other APIs I've listed, such as Enricher, Iregulon, or ChIP-seq to identify uh, other regulatory relationships. And then we can combine these networks and map them to one another and experiment with that. Oh, and uh, <laughs> this uh, last little bonus slide, uh, maybe you've heard of GBT in the news. It's kind of really blown up lately. <laughs> so I, I was experimenting with GBT. I like to say I was experimenting with it well before everyone discovered it on the web just last November. Uh, I was looking at, at getting it to actually filter uh, results data or search results from NCBI much more effectively than NCBI does. Uh, or, or in order to determine which search results were most relevant. But just as I was putting the PowerPoint together, I thought this would be a fun little mini experiment where uh, I took the uh, MIM list that I've been using all along for osteogenesis and perfecta. Uh, and I just asked it to print all of phenotype MIM numbers in the series. And, uh, and I did this, I, I don't have it shown here, but I did it three or four times. And this is what I did every time. It, I got the first 18 of them perfectly correct. I've checked all of those. Those are all accurate if you go to the website, but uh, but I always got the last two wrong and it just sort of made something up for those. <laughs> so, uh, but that's just a, a, an innovative little thought at the end. I thought, you know, it, it would be nice if you, maybe maybe one day as this uh, algorithm improves, because as of yet, there is no programmatic way that I could find to do this yet. The API doesn't include the ability to do this, but maybe a user could say, okay, for input, osteogenesis imperfecta phenotypic series, and then the program will just go ahead and create the, the MIM list. So again, I just want to thank Dr. Feltis, Luo, and Dr. Morris for all of your help for being here and for your mentorship and everything. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. <laughs> Clapping hands. Sure, if anybody online has any questions, go ahead. Devin, I've got a I've got a question. I, I enjoyed that. That was great. Um very interesting, very interesting work and a great presentation. Are you able to hear me? Okay. I am now. I'm sorry, my speaker was muted. What yeah. Now, you're saying I, I I enjoyed that a lot. That was a nice presentation, very interesting work. As as I was listening to it, I was just kind of curious. Uh, you know, would could you flip it around? I mean, if you had a list of genes, would it be informative to go the other direction? You're you're going it's you're you know you're you're going from the phenotype array and through the genes and I I, I don't know. So often we're in the situation where we have a gene list and you're trying to understand well, what is that telling you. Just your thoughts. Is that something that would be feasible to do? Or I I I think that's a great idea. And I'm that's definitely something that I've or, I've thought of exploring that too. Uh namely, probably after this the thesis, I wanted to look at that a little bit. I want to see if you could kind of do exactly that and kind of reverse it. Uh I think if there's only it I can't say there's anything wrong with that idea so much as I can say that I think there was one point where I hesitated or I thought about it and when you, if you have a bunch of genes, I mean, the program, if you is starting with the genes in a sense, because it's just using a bunch of reference numbers OMUM has categorized the disease into, and it's getting all the genes from those. So it's not starting with the, the, the clinical features, even though it's starting with the MIM numbers for that. Uh, but 
so so yeah I've, I've been trying to think too about uh if there's might be a more open way to approach it where you start purely from genes so yeah i guess i was just imagining you know you're doing an experiment in some kind of rna seek something in some tissue or whatever and, and you get a set of genes and you're thinking well now what is that network all about and maybe would it would it have another some variant of that or would it in a different tissue or a different context that i not even what i'm studying that's what I was just imagining, well, maybe it would give you insight into, well, there are some other phenotypic associations that don't happen to be in your particular experiment at all. That was just my my musing as I was listening to you, but. You know. Yeah, yeah, that's an exciting yeah. prospect. And I, I think I will be looking in, into doing something like that afterward, uh, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, anyway, great, thank, thank you. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Uh, any other uh, questions from anybody? We're going to ask questions in a minute, but do you have anything you want to ask now? No. Oh, yeah, absolutely. All right, cool. So um, thank you. That was a great presentation. So what we'll do next is um, the public presentation's over and we'll have a closed door. Uh, meeting with Devin and do do his oral exam for his master's thesis defense. Um, thank you for coming, um, and uh, see you later. Bye.